Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology, also with Carleton University Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. In this video, I'm continuing off on my discussions on carbon dioxide removal. We basically left things too late. We can't just remove, uh, we can't just slow down and stop carbon dioxide emissions, fossil fuel emissions, and preserve our way of life. We're going into abrupt climate change, which is leading to mayhem in our world. We're getting weather whiplashing events. We're getting weather wilding. Uh, it's like cities are dropping in the climate casino, whether it be due to floods or droughts or just uh, huge wind events, uh, heat waves, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we're, we're getting, we're, we're, it's like a march through the book of revelations in real time, as people have said before. So slashing fossil fuel emissions is absolutely required, but it's not sufficient to stabilize our climate system. We have no choice at this stage. We must remove CO2 from the atmosphere. The levels of CO2 are way too high. We're getting ocean acidification, which is threatening the entire marine food chain and we're getting huge increases in the frequency, severity, and duration of extreme weather events, like floods and droughts and storms, and it's wreaking havoc on infrastructure, it's costing billions and billions of dollars. Look at the US in 2017, 307 billion plus, um, the, the, the damage is just in one year. So, you know, insurance companies are gonna go bankrupt, people won't be able to get insurance, it's basically hollowing out countries. It's going to bankrupt countries, and the U.S. is not a, um, immune to that. So this is my website, paulbeckwith.net. Have a look at it. Um, so I'm talking about, I'll, I'll just get the light for better contrast. Okay, so I, I'm talking about um, carbon dioxide removal methods at the moment. So I'll focus on iron fertilization, and uh, I'll specialize on that shortly, but I'm talking about some of these other, other methods um, as continuation of a previous video. So enhanced weathering is a very interesting idea, okay? Um, natural weathering over time removes CO2 from the atmosphere, okay? So, you know, the Earth over millions and millions of years has gone from hothouse situations to, to uh, icebox situations. And when it's an icebox situation, it's basically covered with snow and ice almost to the equator. So the CO2 levels build up because there's no exposed rocks for weathering to remove CO2. Um, the levels are low, it's a cool place, um, very cold temperatures, and then there's volcanic action which puts enough CO2 up into the atmosphere which is not removed because no rocks are exposed, so that builds up and eventually warms up the planet and brings it over into, into a, hot, a hot place. So if we can enhance or increase the rate of weathering, then that removes CO2. Uh, we could do it on the land or in the oceans. So land-based techniques um, in situ carb carbonation of silicate. So if we take um, this rock, for example, we can store thousands of years worth of CO2. Now, the, we need to grind it up in, into small particles to get a large surface area to increase the rate of weathering. Um, Ocean-based techniques involve alkalinity enhancement, so we could grind, disperse, and dissolve. Olivine is one of the most promising minerals because it has a very, very high rate of reaction with CO2. And it can take that CO2 and convert it into rock where it's stored for a long period of time. Limestone, silicates, calcium hydroxide, that would address ocean acidification and that would sequester large amounts of CO2. It's considered one of the least expensive of these options, okay? There's a carb fix project in Iceland, you may have heard about it where CO2 was injected into geothermal, um, there's a lot of geothermal activity, CO2 was injected into the ground, and the, the, um, the out, out the other end, the gases that were extracted were lacking CO2, and it turned out, it thought, people thought that they would be high in CO2, only small amounts would be stored, but a lot of the CO2 was put, was 
converted into rock in the space of just a few years. So very interesting technique. Try to increase the rate of natural weathering. Direct air capture is the idea of using a building a artificial tree, call it. There's about a dozen startup companies, including Carbon Engineering. Um, and the idea is you take the ambient air and you can run it, you, you can run it over chemicals and that, that, that sequester and store the carbon. Then um, if you heat up those chemicals, then the carbon is released, you take it out, you capture it, um, and then it's, so it's a reusable um, chemical. Okay, um, so this idea here, so traditional modes of carbon capture, such as pre-combustion, post-combustion, CO2 capture from large point sources. So that's the idea of, you know, you know, you put a device at the output of an existing power plant that burns fossil fuels and you've got concentrated CO2 coming out of the stack. Instead of putting that into the atmosphere, you remove it, the CO2, and, and you store it in the ground or something. Direct removal or direct air capture. But this technique now is the idea of trying these devices. They, don't, they wouldn't have to be associated with a power plant. They would just be sitting somewhere and they would concentrate the, they would have big fans and blow enough air through the device over the removal system to remove CO2 um, from, the, from normal atmospheric air. It doesn't have to be um, intensified or high um, concentrations of CO2. Um, so a couple of different techniques. Um, you react them with alkali or alkali earth hydroxides to remove the CO2. Carbonation, okay, you're forming the, the rocks. You're taking the CO2 and carbonating, basically um, taking, getting carbonates and storing the carbonate. And there's different organic, inorganic sorbents to absorb. Um, there's porous absorbent, so the CO2 goes inside the material, the, the, the gas goes inside the material, the CO2 is removed. Okay, so artificial trees is a term that will cover these concepts. Okay, um, so if you had huge numbers of these things around the world to remove ambient CO2, um, that's the idea. Um, and this uh, work by Klaus Lackner, um, Columbia, artificial tree technology can suck up to a thousand times more CO2 from the air than real trees can. Okay, about one ton of carbon per day if the artificial tree is about the size of an actual tree. The CO2 would be captured in a filter and then removed from the filter and stored. Okay, um, so there's different ideas, um, different uh, uh, ideas of doing this, of course, um, David Keith from the University of Calgary, who's now at Harvard, I believe, he built a tower, um, fan at the bottom, sucks air in, air goes back out at the top, half the CO2 was removed from the air, that was the initial device, and then it was, uh, then it was put into, uh, like, basically, there's different techniques to try to look at this. Um, Americans, they emit about 20 tons of CO2 per person annually. Okay, Canadians are worse, I think. We're higher than that. Um, so in other words, you need an awful lot of these towers. If you're only pulling out a ton, uh, you know, a ton a day, the thing would have to operate for 20 days to cover one person in the US. So the scaling is always a huge idea. Okay, uh, Carbon Engineering has built uh, scrubbers and they, they're trying to put an emphasis on what do you do with the CO2 that you've, that you've um, removed. Um, you can use it in the production of fuels, for example. If you can make a fuel, a methanol or ethanol type fuel from the CO2, then when you burn that and then you can recapture it, so it'll be you know, a circular thing. It won't be producing more carbon than it's generating. Um, Climeworks built this uh, industrial direct air capture plant. Um, the Swiss-based uh, company. They built it in Zurich, Switzerland. It can scrub 900 metric tons of CO2 per year using heat from a local incineration plant. And then they pump that CO2 into greenhouses to help grow tomatoes and cucumbers and other vegetables. Um, and this is the 
uh, they teamed up with uh, Reykjavik Energy in Iceland, so they pumped this CO2 um, and they pumped it under the ground into bedrock and it reacted in the bedrock to form solid rock, basically, within the space of a several years and that worked very well. Ocean fertilization, I'm going to do a whole video on this because ocean fertilization I think is the cheapest. I think it, it, we know it will work. It will suck huge amounts of CO2 out of the atmosphere. We just have to go and deploy this. Okay, there'll be a lot more research done on this, but I think this is the way that society will go in the very near future in order to slash fossil fuel emissions. Um, and this will go a huge way to uh, reducing, you can scale this up and it's a lot cheaper and I'll explain it. It needs a whole video by itself because by far I think it's the best method. Um, there's other things that you can do. You can use different molecules, calcium oxide, sodium hydroxide. Um, these are some of the chemicals that you can use for direct air capture and I'm not going to go into all of the nitty-gritty details of this. Um, okay, um, and uh, you know, so one of the things is with all these methods is the, you know, is the cost, of course. Okay, um, the American Physical Society estimated direct air capture $600 a ton, um, 3.5 gigatons using bioenergy with carbon capture and storage at 50 pounds per ton was estimated. But again, the big limitation, I'm not a big fan of BEX, which is pushed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change because you need to grow mat organic material that then you're going to burn to capture the carbon. And where do you, where do you grow this stuff on the land? Are you going to, I mean, you, you're going to displace huge amounts of agricultural crops? I don't think so. Um, you know, we're, as our population increases and we're using more and more of the land surfaces, we have less and less land for doing this type of thing. You know, it's amazing to me that even the IPCC with these messes is neglecting the huge potential that we have in the oceans. You know, CDR is slow to act, they say, long-term political and engineering problem, even slower to take effect on acidified ocean. So th this is, uh, I disagree with this. I think, you know, the, uh, the iron fertilization could be done in a matter of decades and draw huge amounts of CO2 out of the atmosphere. And like I said, I'm going to talk about that in an entire, um, entirely separate uh, video. So basically, um, yeah, I'll talk about it in a, in a separate video. Okay, so coming back to here, okay, this this is the, there's a dozen startups that have this like artificial tree type technology. What do they do with the, right now it's not scalable, it's not pulling out that much CO2. It's very hard to pull it out if you're pull, not, if you're not working with direct, with, with um, concentrated CO2. You know, 400 parts per million in the atmosphere is still, you know, low amounts in order, like you need, the higher the concentrations in the atmosphere, the more efficient these devices is, but it's an energy problem. You know, how do you capture such low levels um, of, of a trace element in the atmosphere? And then when you capture it, what do you do with it? If you scale these up, you'd have huge amounts of CO2. Do you try to bury it under the ground, direct bury, you know, put it into the deep ocean where it'll be a solid, um, you know, frozen solid? Um, you know, this artificial upwelling thing is a very interesting technique. How scalable would that be? But I think this by far is the easiest and the cheapest. And what we the idea is to make these vast parts of the ocean that are essentially deserts. We don't have things, we don't have plankton, phytoplankton growing because the water's too warm or we're lacking nutrients, which are below the surface, not at the surface, or there's we're either macronutrients or micronutrients, micronutrients including iron and zinc. And this has been looked at in a number of different initial experiments and we've, they've, they've had hu huge success really. I mean, there's no other way to describe them. So this is where I would put my money. 
Okay, I'm going to talk about this in the next video. Thank you.